What are the big challenges for Mitt Romney in order to make up his gap with President Obama? Well, Patrick Egan, New York University's professor of politics and public policy, joins us this morning. Tell us a little bit about that. Good morning, Patrick. Good morning. It's good to be here. Thanks for coming on. Sure. So, first off, I, Mitt Romney's down about six points nationally, I think, in our last poll. And as you've said, it's, it's been fairly stable. I mean, who are the voters that Mitt Romney really needs to appeal to in order to make up that gap? Um, Mitt Romney, I think, has two challenges right now in terms of voters. First of all, he's got to rally his base. Um, he is a candidate that Republican rank and file have never felt that strongly about. And he, as we saw during the primary campaign, had to do a lot of convincing that he was a true conservative, that uh, he uh, represented their values, etc. So on one hand, in this convention, he's going to be appealing to that base and uh, expressing his conservative bona fides. On the other hand, he's got to make up a few points in uh, the general electorate, and so to, the, to that extent, he also has to appeal to independent voters who are not going to kind of buy the red meat politics that his base will. So it's a little bit of a threading the needle he's got to figure out how to do in the next couple days. Does the selection of, of Paul Ryan really help with those independent voters or not? There's a big debate out there about that. Uh, it was certainly an appeal to the base because he was reaching to his right rather than to the center in uh, picking a, a vice presidential candidate. Um, what he, I think they're trying to do with Ryan is to play up uh, sort of the kinds of uh, things about his background and uh, policy ideas that appeal to independent voters, such as deficit reduction is probably the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing you mentioned that, that you mentioned in an email to me that's fascinating is the Bushes aren't going to be there the last two Republican presidents. And on the other hand, Bill Clinton is going to have a prime speaking slot at the Democratic convention next week, correct? So what does that tell us about the two parties? Well, I think it actually tells something that we don't talk about too much uh, in uh, sort of our coverage of presidential politics, which is that right now, actually, the Democrats enjoy a bit of a natural advantage in the Electoral College in uh, presidential politics in that um, if you look over the last 20, 24 years, uh, Democrats have done pretty well, and the last two Republican presidents have left office uh, in relative state of disregard. Um, so um, it means that Republicans have to kind of think more carefully about their presidential brand than mm -hmm. do Democrats, and that's what we're seeing here. One question I've got, when we talk about independent voters and appealing to men, is there a chance for kind of a, a third way type candidate like Bill Clinton was in the early 90s where you'll get maybe a socially liberal, fiscally conservative. Is there, is there room for that kind of candidate? Well, I think there's a big desire for that kind of candidate. Uh, if you ask a lot of voters, they'd like to see people in the middle, broadly defined, however you want to talk about it. Um, but the structure of our political system makes it very difficult for such a candidate to emerge. We've got two parties that are uh, the, the most polarized that we've seen, either voters or elites in ages. Uh, and when you've got a system that channels all that energy into two parties, it's difficult to get candidates or parties to be in the middle. Now, with conventions in general, we were talking about this with Neil King a second ago, it can be hard really to get voters excited. These are elaborately staged affairs. There's nothing unexpected. Can a convention shake up the race anymore? You know, what we've seen in the past is that they sure can. Uh, so they are heavily choreographed um, uh, pageants, if you will. Um, but at the same time, they actually tell voters something sincere and real about what the p two parties plan to do, uh, how they're presenting themselves to the electorate, uh, and how they talk simultaneously to their base and to a broader audience. Uh, and I actually think voters learn a fair amount uh, from these conventions, and you actually see some movement in the polls, uh, typically uh, a couple of points to any anything from a couple of points to double-digit movement after the conventions in the past. Speaking about what the Republican Party in terms of what they've scheduled, what they've scheduled tells us about the party itself, Talk about the primetime speakers we're going to be seeing and what that says about the Republicans. Yeah, so, you know, on Tuesday night, the, uh, the big speaker is uh, Chris Christie, who holds a, a keynote uh, spot. On Wednesday, we've got Paul Ryan, the VP candidate. And on uh, Thursday, we've got Mitt Romney, obviously the presidential nominee. And what I think is really interesting about those three men is that they all hail from states that the Republicans have not won since 1988. <laughs> so it really tells you something about where uh, the Republicans are trying to get votes. They're trying to show that they've got appeal in blue states, or at least purple states. Um, and it says something about the plan of the convention to move, uh, to broaden its appeal beyond the base independent voters. Now, again, when we talk about these conventions, they have been able, you said, to shake up the race a little bit. Tell us in what ways, I mean, was it really Sarah Palin in, in the last election, maybe Barack Obama's uh, his speech, I guess it was in 2004 now. Um, 2000, yeah, 2004, exactly. The, the, the big speech that, yeah. I guess, launched him. What other 
surprises really have we seen that, that, that changed the course of the political narrative? Well, the way that uh, we political scientists like to think about it is that conventions tend to set in place uh, the sorts of um, uh, back and forth that we would expect given the fundamentals of the race. So right now we've got a relatively weak economy, but not a terrible one. Uh, and an incumbent who is really right about 50% in terms of expected vote uh, come election day. So the question is, uh, the, should the convention sort of move us more toward that place uh, where it, we, we see more of an, even more of a neck and neck race than we see now? Or does something surprising happen uh, that um, in either the Republican or the Democratic conventions that gives one of the two candidates a big advantage? In 2008, we saw Republicans come out of their convention with actually a lead uh, that was then, uh, you know, when Democrats returned serve, <laughs> they uh, came back and had a lead coming out of their convention. So um, I would encourage your viewers not to make too much of polls they see right after this convention, but wait to see what happens after the Democratic convention. That's mm -hmm. going to tell us a lot about the final result. Great. Quick last question, two yeah. seconds. Who wins in November? I never make predictions. I've learned <laughs> that early in my career. I try. So, uh, I try. Come back to me later. <laughs> Professor Egan, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Good to be here.